Totally. Let's talk about the beginning of your journey. I mean, obviously you're an icon level now, but from the beginning, what made you kind of want to foray into music, entertainment? Like what made you want to start that journey? Um, I used to want to play basketball, to be totally honest with you. I was a basketball player, uh, grew up with Mace, Mason Bethel, and we were high school uh, teammates in, at Manhattan Center in Harlem. And I got kicked out of college. He got kicked out of college. He's a year older than me. When I got kicked out of college, he was almost at a record deal with a uh, bad boy at the time. I know that's not really the <laughs> shit. That's Tough it. timing. <laughs> but he almost had a record deal. And when I came home, he was probably, he was trying to sign with Jermaine Dupree, Heavy D wanted him at the time. Everybody wanted him. And it didn't make sense to go back to school when I almost had a deal for Right after him, he signed with Bad Boy. He took me to Biggie Smalls, and it was probably a half a million dollar deal at the time. And basketball really wasn't a guarantee, let alone even getting back in college. So um, I took music more serious. We always used to rap, but it wasn't really serious, like more of a hobby. But uh, that's what made me start when he introduced me to Biggie Smalls and I see him get a record deal, I knew that it could be real. What were some of the challenges that you faced, like kind of trying to get on in the first place? Um, to be honest with you, I kind of didn't have a lot of challenges because by the time I came home from school, Mace probably had the most challenges trying right. to get on. He probably, he kind of laid the red carpet out for me. Um, all I had to do was sit back and wait my turn. Like I said, this really wasn't something that I wanted to do full time. I really wanted to be an athlete, but when you got a half a million dollars on the table at 18 years old in 1995 or whatever year it was, uh, you're going to take that option and perfect your craft. But Mace had more obstacles with me. He kind of just laid the red carpet out for me. Was it tough for you to say goodbye to basketball? I mean, a lot of people in here have dreams or, or a first love, and it doesn't always work out. They got to kind of transition to something else. How tough was that goodbye to basketball for you? Or not, not at all? Not at all. The money was guaranteed. And I was, like I said, with basketball, that was a maybe. So, um not a, not really at all. I always played for a hobby afterwards, but it just took music more seriously. Yeah. How did you uh, kind of transition from just music to also being an entertainment icon, a style icon, or was that just kind of all embedded in you since birth? Uh, as far as you talking about clothing? Or? Yeah, just in general, like oh, you, nah, you transcended beyond like, just yeah, music. Like I'm from Harlem. We try to outdo our friends. You know what I'm saying? Like when new sneakers come out, if you have a man, don't got them, you're like, yo, beat these niggas to the new Jordans or the new Tims or whatever sneaker is out. And when you get to your neighborhood, you want to dress better than the people in your neighborhood, let alone another borough or the rest of the city or the rest of America or anything else. But it was more competition uh, just amongst our friends. And then somebody else I grew up with was like Damon Dash. He's like one of the biggest shit talkers that you ever going to meet. So if you wasn't dressed right around him or Mace or... Anybody else I, used, I came up with, we used to snap on each other and shit like that. So it was just a neighborhood thing. Where did you rank in your neighborhood in terms of like flyness? Were you at the top? Were you the flyest? Were there people flyer than you? When I started getting money, I started getting a little better. But coming up when I didn't have any money, nah, yeah. I grew up really in a real eclectic neighborhood. You know, Big Al was in my neighborhood. He had a record deal first, but he, he wasn't as popular as Mace. He was fresh. Dane was fresh. It was a lot. No, I was not the freshest. When I started getting money, then I started elevating. Right. But growing up, no, nah, I wasn't the freshest. What would you say were some of the things that you think you did early on in your career that differentiated you from the pack? Like, what were some of those things, even before your career, that kind of just separated you from everybody else? To me, it's just my work ethic. I tell people all the time, I don't think I was the best rapper when I was coming up, there was a bunch of rappers better than me, but I kind of outworked them. Even like with basketball, I really wasn't a natural. It was more practice more than anything else. Um, but just my work ethic, like if I like something or if I feel like a winning something, I'm going to work my ass off to be the best. But I wasn't a natural in anything, but I think my work ethic put me above anybody else. What do you feel like are some of the differences in terms of challenges of breaking into the industry? Do you think it's easier these days? You think it's more difficult these days? To me, it's more easier. I mean, it's mad technology. You know what I'm saying? Like <laughs> It's mad technology. It is. Like, when you got a record deal in the 90s, you had to go through different people. This person had to like you, an A&R, and 
the CEO and you have to get marketed, marketing and everything else. Not, not saying it isn't oversaturated now, but now the way the record company works is they don't build artists from the ground up. They just go look at your numbers, how many Facebook friends you got, how many Twitter followers you got, Instagram followers, YouTube hits, and then they want you after you already did all the work. So if you got something like TuneCore, DistroKids, or one of these companies like my man Gazi got, or my man Shites with Cinematic, where they only take a 5 10% to put yourself out, that makes more sense to me because the record company don't want you until you got all the numbers. Then by the time you got all the numbers, you kind of figured it out. So if they're going to give you some real mills that you ain't making, then it's cool. You can make money off YouTube. You can make money off distro kids. Distro kids. You didn't have that uh, when I was trying to get on or trying to start my, my journey as far as music is concerned. You know what I'm saying? So the technology is good. I think it's easier now. Do you think that if you were to start all over again from today with this level of technology, your journey would be easier to success? I don't know about today, but when, let's say, Instagram or Twitter first started, hell yeah, because I would have took advantage of it. I, I think I'm really good at marketing. So I would have marketed everything I was doing uh, using the tools that I had. Now, I'm not saying it can't work now, but now, you know, nobody knew Instagram was going to be the monster it was going to be or Twitter was going to be the monster it was going to be. It turned into something different. So I definitely would have utilized them tools to, like, move my movement forward. For sure. How how has uh, being a good marketer, in your words, benefited your career? Like, what noti- what changes have you noticed uh, marketing has brought you? You got to market anything you do because if nobody knows about it, then how is somebody going to get your shit? You know what I'm saying? Like... You got to make sure, first of all, you got to believe in what you got. And then after that, you got to see what, what the audience is. It's about supply and demand. So it's a bunch of different things. Well, it's, today I'm marketing my clothing. If y'all want to go get it, go to dipsetcouture.net and y'all could go get any sweatsuit, tracksuit, hats, or whatever you want. I sell a male energy drink. I market that on my sports show every day. You just different use different tools, you know? So, I mean, it's no one particular answer, but if you believe in something, just got to market it the best you could. Have you always been a marketing savant, like even back when you was coming up? Or is this, is this something that you had to no, learn along the I way? Learned. No, um, just something that I learned over the years. I was really thinking about opening a marketing company for other people because I think I can mm. promote their shit too. Mm. Like who? Who is somebody that you see out there that you like, oh, I could do something with them? Who got the money? <laughs> you can figure it out. Who paying? Are there some products or some uh, lanes or areas that you feel like are a little bit easier to market? Like uh, you feel like you can market an artist or a brand or like what? I mean, it, you got to believe in a product. I can't sit here and say, yo, I got a skunk. I, I, could, you, could you sell it? Nah, I'm not going to sit here and take on something I don't think I can market if I believe in the project. Like right now, I'll give you an example. It's a, it's a liquor company that wants me to do be the face of their liquor. Right. I gave it to some company I had. Everybody was like, it's disgusting. I'm not being a part of that. You know what I'm saying? I got to make sure that I could believe in the product that I am going to market. So I'm not going to put them on blast, but I'm not going to market that. I got to believe sure. in the product as well. Sure. Now, certain people, though, for the right bag, they're going to act like that's the best liquor they ever tasted. Where Yo, you, you know kind of draw that line in the sand? You know what's funny? I seen Snoop. Snoop Dogg recently, and I'm only going to say this because he said it online, is he he has three different liquors that he's marketing or the face of or whatever. And he's like, I don't drink none of that shit. And he actually said that shit. I couldn't believe it. I was like, I don't know how you're going to catch another check from a liquor company saying that shit, but I'm not going to do that. I got to believe in the product as well. For sure. Uh, you spoke about believing in yourself and believing in your own product. How important do you think it is to not only believe in that product that you have, but have a big following and have a big presence on the internet? Do you feel like that's imperative? Um, I'm not sure. Uh, it depends on what it is. Like, I know a bunch of people that are successful that don't even be online, that's not on the internet. No, it depends on what you're selling. Some people, I believe that every product should be on the internet, but you don't have to be the face of it. Like, you don't know who owns Clorox. You know what I'm saying? It depends on what you're selling. You don't necessarily have to have a face behind every product. But if it's something like 
Think about like if it's diplomats, it's Cam or Jim Jones or Duell's office. When 50 Cent started, it was G Unit, then he puts his artists out. Now he's TV shows. Sometimes you need a face to take your brand somewhere else, but not everybody. I don't think that happens for everybody. Right. It's not imperative. Do you think that uh, there are certain people who are just uh, at the luxury of having some extra help in terms of breaking into the industry? Or do you think everybody kind of enters from an even playing field? I think that you got to be next. I'm trying to think of somebody. Me and Mace was having this conversation. Everybody that we know was next to somebody who was hot to get them hot. Right. Um, we just had this conversation and I was trying to think, I was trying to argue with him about this shit. And I was like, who wasn't really next to somebody um, to get that person hot? So a little help always helps, but somebody always needs somebody to get you where you need to be. These days, it feels like there's so many different platforms. There's YouTube, there's TikTok, there's Instagram. It seems like we have more stars or more people that are famous than ever before. Do you think that's beneficial for the culture? What I will say is that it's beneficial that people get to decide who they like. You know, you get, like I said, when I started, you could brainwash people just playing shit on the radio all day because that's all you had was the radio yeah. or MTV or BT. There's so many different outlets of music or entertainment. Like you could listen to music today and want to watch Sharks tomorrow, then Street Fights the next day. There's so many different sources of entertainment. But what I do like is that people get to decide what they like and not record companies and A&Rs and people like that. Are you spending a lot of time on the internet these days? Do you watch a lot of stuff? Yeah, I mean, your phone, you're in your phone more than anything else because everything's on your phone, you know, whether it's entertainment, whether it's Instagram, whether it's Twitter, whether you got cable and you're not home and you want to watch a game or power or what snowfall or whatever. You can watch everything on your phone. So I'm in my phone a lot. The internet, so-so, no... It's crazy. I was just looking at the day I spent, because they'll tell you on your phone, I spent five hours a day, I believe, last week looking in my screen, they said. So that's a lot. Yeah, brother, I, I hate to say I'm embarrassed. I got almost double that. My shit yeah, is bad. Yeah, it'll tell you. That's what I'm saying. My shit like nine hours. I'm ashamed. Five, I thought five hours was bad. Anybody in here have a screen time higher than nine hours? Okay, I see one hand. All right, at least I'm not the worst person. Okay, good. Shit. Cam, you've been in the game for uh, so long at this point. Does it feel like it's been a long time for you, or does it feel like you're still, you know, starting off? I mean, I'm doing something new right now, so uh, it's dope. Like, you know, I got a sports show now with me, so that's kind of new and it's kind of fun. And music, as far as music is concerned, I just have fun with music. It isn't like a priority, which is super dope for me. Like if I had to do music to pay my bills, I would be pissed the fuck off right now. <laughs> I'd be mad as Why? shit. Because I want, I, I'm fucking almost 50 years old. I don't want to be doing that for a living. Like it's like music is so dope for me now, it's fun. I love doing music because it's not like I have to do music. So right now I'm just having fun with music, but right now doing the sports show with Mace is super duper fun. Like we haven't spoke for 15 years. So seeing him like every day, five days a week, we kind of just picked up where we left off. So that's fun right now. What was the origin story of that? I mean, obviously the show is taking on a life of its own. People love it all over the internet, but what was the, the beginning? Like when did you have the idea or when did Mace have the idea? To do the show? Yeah. I had the idea because I was like, Maze wasn't on the show the first few episodes. It was my show. And then um, I just was arguing with, with niggas on the phone for like two hours about sports. And I'm like, when I, when I get off the phone, I would look, it'd be like two hours and 25 minutes. I'm like, and I'd be mad. And I'm like, I've just been arguing with somebody or two or three people for two hours and 25 minutes about sports. And I'm like, I need to put that energy somewhere where I can make some money from it because sports and politics are never going anywhere. So you have people doing podcasts, they'll be in their kitchen and they living room on their couch or their headphones or whatever. And then you had ESPN, which was really, really professional. 
and there was nothing in between that. And so what I said to myself was, I'm gonna take about 200,000 out of, of my own money. I'm gonna build a set. Um, when I build a set, I'm gonna wear a suit, uh, get a, a host, a female host, and another counterpart to argue with me about sports. And it'll look professional, but we are gonna talk about how we talk in the barbershop or the liquor store, or the gambling spot, or anywhere that urban America is that argues about sports. Because if you walk into a barbershop, it ain't ESPN, they really intense, they arguing right. about sports. So I thought I put those two things together and that's how I started off. I was in Miami, I built a set, auditioned uh, some females to work, uh, actually did four or five shows and then I invited Mace to be a guest on the show. And he liked it and he's like, yo, do you wanna go half on this? Cause I was still in the creative stages. I'm like, I right, bet, let's go half. And then that's how it went. Yeah, Mace doesn't really do a lot of lot of shit, so I didn't think he was serious. I'm like, are you gonna show up? So he showed up every time, and then uh, that's how I went about though. But I just was arguing with my friends on the phone so much that I said I got to figure out a platform to where it looks professional, but we talk how we really talk when we're listening to sports or watching sports. That initial investment you said was somewhere around 200K. Uh, how lucrative of an industry would you say content is? Like building your own show, owning your own show. Is there a lot of money to be made in it? Well, I didn't spend 200 before I got my money back. That was my, except I'm not spending more than this. I spend less than that. I'm building a network now. Content is king. Like, you'll sit there and I remember people used to diss to be like, Oh, you're in the Tubi movie. This, that, and the third, da, 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 Tubi, Tubi, Tubi. And then they ended up selling for like a half a bill um, because it's content. Content, people want content nowadays. Like, I just told you a little while ago, like, you could be in a rap zone this week and then next week you want to watch strippers cooking. You know what I'm saying? It depends on what zone you're in. So uh, you ever go, like, for instance, you ever go to Instagram, right? And you like, I'm about to search something. And then when you're about to search something, explore pages there, and you may see something else that you like. And you like, you're just in a rabbit hole and forgot what you even went to go search on Instagram. Or if you go to YouTube and you're like, I'm going to YouTube for something specifically. And when you get there, something else on the screen already. Now you're watching that. So yeah, you need content. Content is kicked. Is this, tell me more about this network that you're building. You want to have other shows under the same umbrella as yours? Or? Yeah, it's two different networks we're building. We're building a sports network right now where, um, of course, we have to show it is what it is. Our moderator, Trezor Wilson, she has a show called Stat Baby. Uh, we got Mark Jackson, who was formerly with ESPN, used to play for New York Knicks. We gave him a show. It's called The Mark Jackson Show. Uh, and we're building sports shows on this network, the Come and Talk to Me network. But outside of that, we're uh, working on movies, sitcoms, et cetera. Fire. Congrats, yeah. man. Uh, where do you see the future of entertainment going? Do you think it's more self-funded projects like yours, or do you see more of Hollywood coming back with big budgets? Um, everybody doesn't have the money to fund their own stuff. I'm just in a good position, thank God. But... I like to fund my own stuff because I don't like people telling me what to do. Once Hollywood gets involved and they put their money up, they're going to sit there and say, well, we think it should go like that or we think it should go like this. And I'm like, this is my vision. How are you going to tell me how my vision should go? So I like to pay for my own stuff, take it to them and flip it that way. I don't like them. To, I don't like nobody giving me money because you have to listen to partners and get their input, so on and so forth. So for the last probably... 15, 20 years, I haven't had partners on anything because it's my vision. I don't need you telling me how my vision should work, but I dig it because everybody doesn't have the funding to do that. So sometimes you may need an investor. For sure. I guess lastly, wrapping up, uh, you've cemented yourself, obviously, musically. Now you're cementing yourself in the sports world. What do you want your legacy to be when this is all said and done? Like, what do you want people to remember Cam for? That's a good question, man. You know, uh, even better question is that, to end, not to go be long-winded with your question, but somebody asked me if it was something that I would do or a job or not a job, an investment or one of my business to make me stop wanting to do other businesses. And I'm like, I really don't know. Because once one thing is rolling, 
I'm off to the next thing. Like if the sports show is working, so I'm going to do sitcoms and sitcom is working. I'm going to do more movies or if my clothing is, so I don't know exactly what's going to make me say, look, okay, cool. I don't need to do nothing else now. I'm always going to look for something else to do. So as far as my legacy is concerned, I like people, like I said er, uh, earlier, just respect my work ethic. You know what I'm saying? Because at the end of the day, I never was the best at anything. I wasn't a great basketball player until I practiced. I wasn't the best rapper in my neighborhood until I practiced. I'm not sitting here saying I'm not the best sports broadcaster, but my show is ranked number two on, on YouTube amongst all sports shows outside of First Take. It's all about practicing and consistency and, like I said earlier, marketing what you're doing. So uh, I guess I would say my work ethic. All right. Yep. Final question. Uh, a lot of people in this room, I'm sure, have dreams and aspirations of making content um, because they've seen you successfully do it. What would you say is the biggest uh, difficulty starting out that maybe you could give them as like a, a, a heads up so they know what to expect? Uh, people just saying you can't do it. It's not going to happen. Uh, a good support system uh, would definitely work because um, everybody's not as talented as they think they are either. You know what I'm saying? So <laughs> that's, a, that's where the fine line is that where you got to say to yourself, okay, what am I good at? And is this really going to work? as opposed, because your bills will catch up to you trying to follow your dreams. Mm. And um, just having the people to tell you what's real and what's not. So support system, I would say. Support system, indeed. All right, y'all. Make some noise for Cameron. Thank man. you, guys. I appreciate y'all. Thank y'all. Yep.